welcome to part two of this episode of Void War, detailing the craft of the Imperial Navy. If you haven't seen part one, click the link in the video description below. And if you haven't seen the methodology video in which how we're calculating oh, how these things move and how they work, there'll also be a link in the video description below as well. So let us continue our look at Imperial Battle Cruisers with the Dominion class. Now, the Dominion was meant to be a replacement for the Mars class, optimized to carry large amounts of attack craft and having lance batteries to satisfy the big gun enthusiast. Though it fared poorly in smaller engagements, though it did actually do quite well against uh, the Nids in the Battle of Macrag. I can see why it did well against the Nids, because if you don't have to get close to the Tyranids, you generally don't die. This has in theory. All, this has, <laughs> that's a very good theory. This has all the benefits of being an all-rounder as the Mars class, but instead focusing on attack-style craft for attack and defense. However, the fact is that the way said cruisers are often employed is counterintuitive to their design. Imperial tactics of the 40k era often rely upon leading from the front and using your ship as a brawler. Battle cruisers are meant to fill the role where Imperial battleships, battle cruisers are meant to fill the role where Imperial battleships are not available. This means using attack craft and close range engagements is going to get things ripped apart. As mentioned in the previous episode, imagine opening your launch bay doors to launch a wing of bombers just as a macro cannon round flies in. Yeah, lots of damage. Coupled with the thin armor and it being a very slow ship for its size, the Dominion is built around being a fleet carrier that stays away from the enemy, yet it is often used as a replacement for a battleship. I know why the Imperial Navy halted orders for these after 10, because they kept using it wrong. <laughs> this, this is the perfect illustration of how the Imperial Navy's constant changing of tactics without focus from sector to sector, coupled with ship build times that take decades. By the time a ship is built, a change in doctrine has already made it obsolete. The design to me is solid if you stay away and obey principle number two, acting as a carrier and letting your fighter craft do the damage. These battle cruisers are proving themselves, however, to be the same type of machines that we built upon Earth-based navies and called battle cruisers. Death machines that were obsolete before they could even prove the concept of speed plus firepower when vessels really are not capable of delivering the firepower if they're expected to close to point-blank range and they have no armor for which to do it. It's like you want to be point blank with the sun or the planet Mercury. Aha! Let's see what you did there. So, next up is the Mercury class, which was a battle cruiser designed to counter smaller pirate and raider vessels. It doesn't really have the armor protection of other battle cruisers, but it compensates with this with a much faster propulsion system. This ship is designed purely for long range, its lance batteries being extremely accurate sniper weapons while the small craft work on the principle of hitting the enemy with precision strikes inside their shields. However, due to the constant use of these ships at close range as illustrated with the Dominion, um, battle cruisers are expected to act in a way in the Imperial Navy that's not a good idea to design ships to operate at long range. They, this one doesn't even have brawling guns. It has longer range, slower firing, less destructive lance batteries made for precision hits. It appears by the Battle of McCrag when the Imperial Navy learned don't get close to the Tyranid Hive ships that this ship was able to do what it was designed to do. The issue being that since it relies on its fighters, if you remove those, it's mostly just defanged. The lance batteries are often capable of hurting void shields, but really lack the destructive power to rip through meters of armor. Speaking of armor, battle cruisers lack that. 
remembering our own designs again from World War II and going further out there to say this, this is not even a battle cruiser so much as a battle carrier. It just wants to reach out and touch you from a very long way away. Kind of like a serpent in a way. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you couldn't tell by that segue, next up, the Long Serpent class, which has, let's be honest, a kind of a weird name for a battle cruiser. But anyway, this thing has brutal firepower thanks to four weapons batteries, a single lance battery, and a Nova cannon. Though its armor's still not particularly good, and, well, they tend to suffer from catastrophic warp drive failures, so basically if it goes down, it's taking pretty much everything else around it with it. Hold on. Did you just say that they've created a battle cruiser that has a ton of guns is really fast, but has a tendency to explode in a way that kills it and its escorts. Yes, both physically and on a spiritual level. <laughs> so the tech priests of uh, Hydrofer still haven't learned what others have learned, that sacrificing armor is a bad idea. Yeah. And again, like last time, we are not taking Void Shields into account. We are assuming that the Void Shields have collapsed for the purpose of these videos. I mean, I I would assume Void Shields would have collapsed if this thing pulls up broadside with a uh, Retribution-class battleship and they have an exchange of fire. And then I would expect it to explode and remove the entire side of the Retribution that was firing at it. These are made... <sighs> This is made not to act like a frontline fighter, but for the purpose of chasing down pirates, smaller ships, and the occasional trader cruiser. The mention of the destructive power of exploding warp drives is interesting and puts an extreme damper on using this ship in a frontline capacity, rather than a long-range flanking ability of it being faster than a battleship, being able to deliver the firepower of one. Now. When employed correctly, examples being the Nemesis and the Swift Striker uh, ships of this class, it's only slightly slower than a Chalice, but it's so much better armed. And with the Chalice only packing torpedoes and two batteries per side, this ship packs a ton more firepower and a Nova Cannon to suppress or keep the enemy scared while it closes to its close range ability. The Lance Battery able to precision target particular threats that need some extra love while you're trying to get in range to use those close to use those broadsides. This means the ship is incap is very capable of inflicting precision attacks against a designated target at medium to long range. It appears as though the Imperium, or at least Admiral Knightsbridge, has learned from the failings of the Chalice class. I suppose time will tell with the rising of the Primarchs. Back to the grand old glory days of the 30th, 30th millennium. <laughs> or, wait, uh, those cruisers I, uh, suck. <laughs> I have to say that these segues are getting quite painful. <laughs> I mean, you know, I could stop. Nah, it's fine. Let's inflict the suffering on everyone else as well. I, I apologize to everyone watching, but... I had to you knew what you signed up for when you started watching this video, so... That's true, and I did have to suffer with six months of research for this video. Yes. You feel the warp overtaking you. It's a good pay. <laughs> I assure so, everyone, I have less research to do now for all the other fleets. I just have to do the big research first. You were saying... There's also the, there's also the fact that the other fleets tend, will probably have a lot less variety in their ship classifications. But anyway, next up, we'll be taking a look at Grand Cruisers, which are smaller than a battleship, but larger than a battle cruiser. Now, these ships tend to be actually, well, incompatible with modern Navy tactics, and so that's 
they tend to be held in reserve as part of a reserve fleet. But they're still large and heavily armed. So let's take a look at the first of these, which is the Vengeance class, which is still a better name than a Long Serpent. Now it has weapons, batteries, and two lancers on our side of the ship, which gives it enough firepower to hold its own against a cruiser or a squadron of escorts. It has better shields than the cruiser, but again, we're not taking shields into account here. The turret layout of the ship is able to protect it from a few attack craft waves, but if it's subjected to a heavy attack, it will allow them to get through. So, uh, interesting question in regards to this one. How chaos not just used Imperial uncorrupted cruisers with an Imperial transponder codes to infiltrate fleets? I have no idea. Though, though knowing the Alpha Legion, they probably have. Just a thought. <laughs> um, we can see the evolution of ships over 10,000 years. It hasn't changed much. It's just been honed and modified, but the core design is here with the Vengeance class. It's clearly a long-range vessel, relying on precision lance batteries for its main weapons, and macro cannons for anything that gets close. Think of it this way. This is designed just like a really big Lunar-class cruiser. The tradition of using lance weapons to destroy void shields and attack critical systems, while macro cannons rip at armor trying to tear a ship in half or hoping to break its spine, causing her to break up and be destroyed outright. This has been a tried and true design for apparently 20 some odd thousand years. It was made to work as firing lances closing in and lining up for that golden macro battery shot since the lance batteries can't miss and can hopefully herd the enemy into a particular area or target smaller vessels like escorts and just rip them apart. To illustrate how close this design is to stuff we know, know already, the Lunar class cruiser is roughly two-thirds the size and only packs one less lance battery to each side than this vessel. Uh, the Lunar class also has more armor, torpedoes, and a ramming prow. It's just a bigger Lunar cruiser, minus the torpedoes and the ram prow. And the Lunar is the most produced Imperial vessel to date. So, uh, Vengeance, Avenger, does that get confusing over comms trying to order that those types of cruisers around? Maybe if someone calls it an Avengeance or Revengeance, you know, have one commanded by, you know, Admiral Raiden. Was that a terrible joke? I don't know. But yes, the Avenger class Grand Cruiser. This ship is, quite frankly, an extremely aggressive one. It's designed just to charge into the heart of an enemy fleet and then do as much damage as possible. Uh, so its weapons are quite short range, but incredibly powerful, and it also has four squadrons of attack craft to deal with targets at a greater distance. So uh, It's basically the orc of the Imperial ship world. The orc of the Imperial ship world? Yeah, it just charges and gets stuck in. Why do I feel like this vessel is something designed in the 1800s? I can envision now a space version of the Battle of Gibraltar sending lines of these ships in to break up the enemy formation as they get shelled back and forth in return. Which is exactly how they're described being used. They prefer macro cannons and that's all this thing has. These ships are likely to suffer from ammunition problems, considering that it weighs 40 megatons. It carries four batteries, totaling 20 cannons, each hurling a one kiloton projectile. Excuse me, one megaton projectile. I, I simply don't see them possessing a massive stockpile of ammunition. Due no. to their size and design, as well as the size of their ammunition. The ship is also more than three times the cubic meters of a standard cruiser, making it a much larger tar target. And I believe they did this on purpose. If you're going to have 
ships leading lines of incoming assault vessels to break up the enemy battle formation, you want to have them not only draw fire, but have the armor protection to absorb hits as well as shield the smaller craft coming in behind them. It's also slow and requires an obscene number of crewmen. A standard battle cruiser requires around 100,000. Cruisers are estimated between 59 and 65,000. This requires 141,000 crewmen. We gotta get those shells for those macro cannons loaded. That is the population of a major city. I understand humanity has a seemingly limitless number of people to throw into battle, but if you remember that every one of these crew must be trained, fed, clothed, and prepared to go in co into combat and do their job. In fairness, a lot of these ships are pretty much self-contained ecosystems now, where you have entire generations of people who are born, grow up, and die upon those ships. It's true. I also mean in fairness that if you, if a boarding pod slams into said ship, do you just sit there for the first like 40 minutes just shooting unarmed crewmen? Like, okay. Is that how that works? <laughs> in real life, even the lowliest seaman requires eight months of training to do their job, and that's to be a cook. A crew of this size... Like, if you were building one of these brand new, you have to take a full year to recruit and train them for all of the specialist jobs that are going to be required on board the ship. You have 24 hours. <laughs> the lack of automation and specialization means that things like fire and decompression provides this vessel with the distinct ability to find itself losing a lot of its guns just because the crew got decompressed and thrown out into space. Still, plenty more ratings where they came from. I would criticize smaller vessels for this, but losing an entire battery of guns is usually half the firepower of the ship, rendering it combat ineffective. But when a light peppering from fighters against the gun batteries can cause the guns to stop working because a few hundred thousand people just died. Um, I want to point out that's one fighter pilot shot around, hit a turret, and 10,000 people died. It's probably a concern with these older Grand Cruisers who were said to have not have full protective frontal prowls like, pre like the previous vessels we have discussed, nor the amount of armor that the newer Cruisers seem to have. We see this shift from these old tactics and how Ship of the Line fights often render your own fleet just as destroyed as that of the enemies. And now, many of these have been mothballed. This is due to just how much manpower is required to run one of these ships and how often I imagine they're having to drag them back to be repaired. Mm. So, uh... I feel like I need a priest, a tech priest, to exercise me of this ship. Yes, and on that note, next up is the Exorcist. Now, the Exorcist is mainly deployed to remote areas such as the eastern fringes of the Galactic Halo due to their ability to act independently of a support fleet, as it has the firepower of larger vessels and can launch attack craft from its flight bays. Now, while these have been viewed as being obsolete, they are quite popular with, well, colonists, as they can act as a transport and an escort. This is what I would consider a real attempt by the military of the 30th millennium to create a flagship. It's designed to operate under the condition of allowing the rest of the fleet to advance while this one hangs back and deploys fighters as well as bombers to provide the punch. The Exorcist is said to contain nearly exclusively launch bays with a single set of macro battery cannons for close-in defense. They could be using Avengers to provide the line breaking while the Exorcist is back as the command vessel and directing its fighters to precision points in the enemy line in order to help break it up. I can truly see these being used very similar to their 
predecessor, the Dominion class battle cruiser, just much larger for the tactics at the time and very suited to the position of flagship that hangs back like a fleet carrier and keep providing the orders of battle while its bombers go in and say, hi, that's a shiny bridge you have there. The shift in tactics from Avenger-style broadsiding to lances and fighters and back to broadsiding is like the Imperial Navy can't make a doctrine and stick with it. Furthermore, they seem to not be factoring in how long these vessels take to build and are reverting back to tactics now considered obsolete during the Great Crusade. When we get to battleships, you will see exactly what I mean and why myself as a scientist am absolutely furious <laughs> at just how <laughs> silly the doctrine changes are. In case you couldn't tell, next up is the Furious class, which was used primarily as portable firepower, upping the power of Imperial squadrons to almost battleship levels thanks to two weapons batteries, a lance battery, and torpedo tubes. They were successful, but had quite a few engine issues. So the Imperium actually did something right for a change and actually went through a rebuild to, well, make them more reliable, but at the cost of reducing their weapon strength. So, wait, 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 wait. The Imperium learned from their mistake and refit their ships accordingly. Apparently, with this class at least. It should be noted that this type of design is very heavily suited to chaos, apparently, because it's a consistent flagship for their forces! Gee! Wonder if it's a good ship. It seems the combination of two heavy weapon batteries plus lances, a ramming prowl, and torpedoes is in fact truly the best design the Imperium of Man could possibly come up with. They keep using it over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Lunar, Vengeance, Overlord, Dauntless Mark II, all of these have the exact same weapon loadouts. Lance batteries or a lance turrets, heavy macro cannons, ramming prowl, torpedoes. It just works. The Furious is an excellent example of it if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or hey, we just rewrote the book, and guess what? The book actually works now. Thanks, Gilliman. And the ironic thing probably is is whoever actually did the refits and redesign probably got executed for tech heresy. I know, right? <laughs> Now, taking this into account, I think Chaos had the same idea. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Many Furious class battle Grand Cruisers still are in service to Chaos. It should also be noted that the ones of note are not ones destroyed, but ones that consistently win battles two or three times outnumbered. Measuring the ship, they have some of the thickest armor plating that we've ever that we've seen as of yet, with 2.1 meters of armor plating using 3D modeling. And it's almost as much as a squat land train. I know, right? <laughs> and they're incredibly light for crew numbers, indicating 112,000 crew. Um, this is one of the Grand Cruiser designs that requires the fewest number of people to operate. Um, which is even smaller crews than some of the newer battle cruiser designs. Chalice. <laughs> they are classified a basic design for the Grand Cruisers, but keep proving themselves over and over again. That unlike the super specialized ships, such as the Exorcist or the Chalice, this one or two battery, one lance battery or lance turret, and torpedoes and ramming prow seems to be the thing that they should design all of their ships around. I, I don't see why they keep making these specialty ships if they're just going to hurl them suicidally at things to cause them to explode. Oh wait, that's what they do with Emperor class battleships. Is it time to talk about battleships now? I, I, I think we've teased them enough. Fair enough. So, battleships. They're big. 
They're slow. They're heavily armoured. They've got a lot of firepower and typically serve as a flagship for the Admiral of the fleet. Though this isn't always the case. But, yes, uh... They're very big and very powerful, generally speaking. So let's start off by taking a look at the Apocalypse class, which is a lance attack craft and one of the only battleships in the Imperial Navy armed with a Nova cannon. This is the absolute epitome of sniper class vessels. Still using broadside tactics, but with an emphasis on extreme accuracy and extreme range. This works incredibly well. As a flagship, it doesn't have to get close to deliver its full firepower, and it can literally look with all of its lance batteries and its Nova cannon and go, You. Yeah, you. Stop existing. By just having every single shot focus on the exact same point on an enemy ship and just cutting it in half. You said they had heavy armor. The thin, I don't mean thin armor, I mean thin as in width of the ramming prow doesn't cover the batteries from the front of the ship and leaves them exposed to frontal fire. The armor plating is roughly 3.7 meters thick based on taking the ship Plugging it into a CAD program, scaling it up, and then using the measurements provided. This makes it one of the best armored vessels yet. The only issue is keeping away from the enemy. At 1.8 gravity's acceleration, it makes it incredibly slow. Agonizingly so. Which so, I assume would be a common flaw with all these uh, battleships. Yeah, mostly. A small fleet of ships that are incredibly quick, such as Dauntless Mark II's punching through the battle line aimed at this ship, will likely destroy it if they get in close, since the Lance batteries are both slower firing and slower and slow to rotate to bring their weapons to bear. Lance batteries are made for long range, not rapid fire. And like other ships in this class, it cannot function in a multi-role environment. It needs fighter escorts, it needs smaller escorting ships for a picket line, and it needs a battle line to provide it with protection so its lance batteries can work their magic of picking one ship at a time and going, You cease to exist, and erasing that ship from the enemy's defenses. I ain't got a pun or a joke or anything for the next ship because it's just weirdly named. Yes. Next up is the Oberon class battleship, which is a jack of all trades, which is, let's be honest, not necessarily a bad thing. It's designed to deal with pretty much any threat as it has lances, weapons, batteries, and waves of attack craft. The, the aware of the array of weapons is, well, enough to be able to cause damage at long range, and with the aid of lances, it can cripple a cruiser-sized ship in short order. This is a case of every weapon system. Gotta collect them all. The ship has literally every single weapon the Imperium currently uses, save for a Nova cannon. It's very much a multi-role battleship that doesn't rely on any single vector of attack or assault. It has heavy armor across the ship at roughly 3 meters thick. While it doesn't specifically work in any one role, having this many different systems allows it to engage in any sort of engagement. Fighting orcs, stay away and use lances and fighters. Fighting Elgar, Eldar, fill the, the sky with fire with no way for them to dodge. The vessel is more what I expect of in a battleship of the Imperium. No focus, but rather a Swiss Army knife prepared for any situation. Um, I can't c classify this as a carrier or a broadsider because it just does it all. It doesn't do anything particularly great, so it probably doesn't make a great flagship considering it will be constantly repositioning itself in the battle line to suit the sort of engagement you're involved in. A mid-range engagement, up close, 
long range support. It can function in all these, but a pragmatic captain will have to understand when to use the ship in the best possible light for the situation it's currently involved in. It's also one of the faster battleships at 2.2 gravities. It's not going to outrun anything smaller than it, but it certainly isn't going to slow down the rest of its escort fleet and lose a lot of its tactical capability because it's slow compared to every other battleship on this list. Indeed. I really question why more of these haven't been built. It can handle any situation. It can keep up with its escorts and having any one of its weapon system nullified by enemy tactics or technology doesn't cripple it. It just means that okay, stop using that gun. Use a different we can put pow more power to the to the lance batteries or we can shift our crew over to the macro cannons. <sighs> Emperor save me. Why these shipyards do the things that they do, I will never understand. Next up is the Emperor class battleship and let's be honest, Carrier has arrived. <laughs> the main armament of the Emperor class is eight squadrons of attack craft. And that's pretty much it. <laughs> I have to point out before I start talking about the Emperor class battleship that there are six of these that they have driven into enemy fleets and self-destructed. Well, I mean, if it works. You're operating in space. You can I always, mean, if it works. <laughs> you can always pull back and get more fighters. This ship works on the principle of carrier combat. You said carrier has arrived. We weren't kidding. Eight. Eight carrier-based light cruisers would be required to get the same number of attack craft in the air. And that's not counting its dorsal lance batteries. That's not counting the massive amount of flak its turrets can put up for fleet defense. And that's not counting the fact that these things are virtually indestructible. I really have to ask, though, why you would give this thing a ramming prow? It seems like the Imperium really is just into sticking it in there. And it's the exact opposite of any tactic you would ever want to engage this vessel in. There are more fighters on this ship than there are on any other Imperial vessel multiplied by two. The sheer number of small craft it could possibly launch might actually be able to set up a formation to look like a light, to look like a full size lunar class cruiser traveling alongside it. I am completely and utterly with the Emperor's text to speech device. You can't build more of them. Why do you use them for suicidal ramming tactics when? you can accomplish so much more damage with bombers. This is a massive living city, by the way. It takes a quarter million 250,000 people to make it work. It also requires more training for individual personnel, additional fighter craft, and takes generations to build one of these things. The small craft are easy to replace, their fighter pilots not necessarily so much so, but I just imagine that with the sheer number of people, they have a leaderboard for their fighter pilots for best in the fleet, and it's constantly rotating from them dying. It makes sense. <laughs> the ship is extremely extremely heavily armored and its landing bays are concealed from frontal attack by the massive prow. You can literally point this thing towards the enemy and they have no recourse to hit the landing bays. And for a vessel of its size, it can keep up with the Oberon class ton for ton, gravity for gravity in terms of acceleration. 
I would personally say anyone who commits one of these to the main battle line is a total fool and should be shot for heresy. Because they truly don't understand the tactical capabilities of this ship in terms of fighters. Meanwhile, the vessel is also a symbol of Imperial might and myth, hence why it should be held at carrier ranges and stay in command of vessels as well as a line coordinator. I can totally see that if one of these explodes, the whole line breaks. The only issue I can see with it is the lack of extra sensor and communications equipment you would think that a flagship of the Imperium would have. Without that, coordination is likely to be just as vulnerable to jamming and interference as the rest of the fleet. But beyond this, this is a carrier through and through. With enough weapon batteries to defend itself from small escorts or individual attackers that might slip in to go at it, the vessel uses its surprising speed to move away from close range engagement and overwhelm enemy defenses with fighters, bombers, boarding craft, and just imagine the number of voidsmen it could deploy from its fighter base. You could literally build your own escort fleet by capturing enemy ships. A tactic I'm actually shocked the Imperium hasn't employed. Well, am I have done. <laughs> just not on too grand of a scale. That's fair. That's fair. So I hear they have another one of these type of ships that's nothing but guns. Yes, the Retribution class, which is described as being a true ship of the line, being able to deliver a devastating broadside assault upon the enemy, and also has a crap ton of ordnance. A true ship of the line? Apparently so. Again, I'm beginning to wonder if orcs have infiltrated the tech priests. <laughs> this little mech boy just sitting in a red road going, Praise that Omnisire! How many guns can we fit on it? That is the philosophy here. It's a broadsider! A very good one. It's going to rely on those big, massive broadside battery tactics. I can see Avenger class cruisers leading the fleet with one of these behind them saying, Don't turn or I'm going to cut you in half. However, the fact of the matter is, it may have all of these weapons, but it lacks speed and maneuverability. This is the slowest battleship that we're going to discuss. <sighs> Why would you make something designed to get point blank and then it doesn't have the speed to get there? <laughs> um... We, we, call, we call it the Top Gear rule of design. Ambitious, but rubbish. They require more crew and space for said crew than any other vessel, and it's a huge drain. <laughs> so I have an honest question to ask. Why is this ship so slow and hard to maneuver if it has the same engines as the Oberon and Emperor while having a third of the crew, th less crew of the Emperor at 192,000 people? And so much lighter weapons in terms of weight or power requirements. And the answer is, I want to hurl massive, massive objects. The ammunition for this ship probably weighs as much as the ship. I also very big bullets. <laughs> I also imagine if you're boarding said ship and you happen to land inside of an ammunition storage, you look around and go, huh, I think I'm just going to hurl this satchel charge and get back on my boarding craft to get off this thing. You think you'll be able to escape in time? No, but it's, but, but I got to hope for something. It has the exact same armor thickness as every other ship in the, of this hull. And it's expected to do most of the frontline fighting. I would have thought you'd put more armor on it. It doesn't even make two gravities of speed and is said to turn with the inertia of a moon. So pretty slow then. Um, I, I, 
again, imagine the best way to kill one of these things is just to direct hit to an ammo cache. All this said, I'm quite surprised the Imperium doesn't resort to such vessels more often because they seem to have this policy of smash it, smash it in the face repeatedly with more guns. Rimlays, can we talk about the next battleship, please? You mean the one that's a heavily modified variant of the Retribution? Uh, yes, the Victory uh, class. Uh, so, internal layout and weapon systems, pretty much the same, but the main difference is that it has lance systems equipped to the ship in place of the Retribution's large amount of attack craft hangers, and it also has a Nova Cannon. Do orcs just not like fighters? Apparently not. Uh, Smite-O-Matic comes to mind with this vessel? The lance weapons may not be as powerful as macro batteries, but are extremely accurate. The lack of torpedoes switched over to the Nova Cannon seems contradictory if you're expecting this thing to close into the same ranges that the Retribution fights at. You may remember in massive space battles like this um, that the Retribution firing all of its macro cannon batteries is going to deal damage to the enemy ship, but it's going to deal damage over the entire hull. Whereas this thing using precision lance weapons at point blank range are going to deal damage to one particular spot. If a ship breaks in half, you've basically killed it. Um, it doesn't matter if the engines still work, if the crew and most of the systems are flying out the, the front of the ship. The vessel has precision aiming with things traveling at the speed of light, including the Nova Cannon, meaning that if she acts the same way as the Vengeance and just targets one particular section, she can slice the bridge away or say, oh look, your prow is missing. I feel the victory with the Nova Cannon and its lapse weapons should do just that. It should use its macro batteries only to provide suppressing fire to force a ship to move in certain directions so it can bring its Nova Cannon and lance weapons to bear. This is the closest ship in the entire Imperial list that comes to using spinal type weapon tactics where they're relying on one really big weapon to get the enemy in front of the ship and pull the trigger. While it has the features of other battleships, it lacks fighters and the must rely on staying away and escorts to provide fighters for it. At least it can sit there and cut away threats one volley at a time and know that when it fires, whatever it just fired at stops moving. At least that's the tactical analysis I would give it. It seems mm. the Imperium is in favor of longer range battleships and the ability to keep their flag vessel away from harm rather than close in tactics described by the Grand Cruisers. Have they learned their lesson? Please tell me there's more ships that are battleships that are made to not get point blank. Well, next up is the Nemesis class. So, remember how the Emperor class was Carrier Has Arrived? This is Carrier Carrier Has Arrived, in a sense, as it's, well, it's a modified Emperor class with even more room for attack craft. So I heard you like your fighters. How about I give you more fighters? But I need guns. You don't need guns. This is designed on the same principle as a modern aircraft carrier. They don't have guns. They just have aircraft. Short and simple, it's an Emperor class battleship where they went, those macro cannons didn't come in handy. Give it more fighters. <sighs> it's the first true carrier we've actually seen in this entire series for the Imperium. All the rest of them have some form of macro battery, but nope, nope, it just has lance turrets on top of its the dorsal of the ship, and 
it's proven that it can just launch a massive 12 wings of fighters and bombers. Which, honestly, is going to overwhelm any ship. It doesn't matter how many defense turrets you have. So basically, it's like, if you ever played StarCraft and got like 12 Protoss carriers and fully upgraded them and just launched them, it's basically just that. To you illustrate know, we'll... this, um, the... The Death Star attack in Episode 4... Go on. 191 rebel fighters. This ship launches 576 fighters and bombers. It That's launches, a lot. <laughs> it launches five times the number of attack craft the rebels used to destroy the Death Star. So I'm just imagining sitting there on the Death Star and going, huh, that's no moon. That's a fighter attack wing. Coming out of a ship's about eight kilometers long. I honestly don't have a lot more to say on this one. It's an Emperor with no guns and all of the bombers. Remove an escort and it's remove its escorts and it's just a fleet carrier in real life without escorts. Vulnerable to everything. Protect this ship and keep it surrounded with defenders. And the nemesis is really gonna be the nemesis of everything in the battle line because all that's gonna happen is you're gonna be sitting there going, We're holding our own, we're holding our own. What is that on radar and why does it look like an enemy fleet? Oh, it's just six hundred <laughs> fighters. Crap. Right, so, so next up, we have the Vanquisher class, which, well, not really too much to say about this one, really. Um, there's about four of them. <laughs> and they're being currently rearmed and recruited. That's about it. These are one-of-a-kind vessels, and history has always had a problem with one-of-a-kind ships. They are built using the best and most developed technology of the day, only to prove that technology is obsolete by the time it's employed. Examples, Yamato and Bismarck, defeated by air power in both cases. The fact is, if you build a ship strictly on proven technology to be a one-of-a-kind superweapon, you will always end up with something that is defeated by new technology or simply too specialized for its own good. I firmly believe that's why they mothballed these things in the first place and why they're having to refit them, bringing them out of mothball. It's never proven itself, and battleships require years to train their crews. They require huge support facilities and specialized maintenance techniques as well as just whole cities of people to operate them. I can understand retiring as a design that not only never had a chance to prove itself, but was never entered mass production. It's like the equivalent of expecting the mouse tank to stop the entire Red Army. They're just going to go around it until it runs out of gas. And considering mass production is no longer viable for battleships, I also understand why refitting and pressing these into combat is kind of important, but losing a battleship in the Imperium is like a major event. There are conflicting reports on the number of these made, but I see no reason considering the lack of armament information for them not to just refit them as Emperor class or Retribution class battleships, whichever one they're already fitted close enough to being anyway. And the Vanquisher apparently, despite being built to be state-of-the-art, top-of-the-line, best of its time, has a reputation for being an aging design that no longer functions in the Imperium. I guess it's not as invulnerable as they thought it would be. No. Speaking of which, I believe this will be the final ship we'll be taking a look at today. Uh, the Invincible Class Battleship. Don't let the name fool you. It's nowhere near Invincible. 
In fact, uh, it has inherent design flaws in the internal compartmentalization and issues with backup systems and the power distribution grid. Now, while it proved to be incredibly successful as an anti-piracy tool, they proved to be poor line battleships due to their poor protection. And because these were designed by a man named Admiral Kishner, they became informally known amongst the Navy as Kishner's Combustibles. Uh, this is a classic example of the Imperium not using ships the way they were designed to be used. In real life, fast battleships like the South Dakota and Alabama were used to protect the fleet. Their firepower, speed, anti-air capability, and significant defense against enemy surface ships while carriers, cruisers, and destroyers can do their jobs were considered a true asset to the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Marine Corps considered their guns to be, and I quote, instant foxhole creators. The ship is designed in that spirit. It is less survivable in a straight-up fight, but it isn't made for that. It is designed to protect the rest of the fleet, used to keep to help smaller ships do the specialized jobs they were designed for. The Imperium doesn't seem to get that, and I can appreciate this design. You need a battleship in a in a place really fast? This one's faster than every Grand Cruiser and the vast majority of battle cruisers in existence. And it's still a battleship. It has more armor than these ships, more firepower, and can deliver a hell of a punch while taking a beating and still move 2.7 gravities per second. It has... This design is incredibly solid, just they don't use use it for what it's designed for. I really just... I really wonder how an Imperium Admiral's officer school is? Do they just go... Here's the tactics of the year, and then if you don't come back and take more classes, you don't learn updated tactics? Or do they not have individual tactics that they spell out for individual ship classes? No, what they do, they just pray to the Emperor and go, good luck. <laughs> In the Imperium, um, and this is my final personal note, there always seems to be this expectation that regardless of tech, vehicles, weapons, or whatever they happen to be using, they have universal designs that just are supposed to use the same tactics as everything else, and not specialized for different tasks. Would the Imperium be better if they made fewer classes of ship, with a more Swiss Army knife feel to them? Considering the training and expectation that Imperial commanders place on these vessels, yes. They often build specialized vessels such as the Chalice or the Invincible and then don't employ the tactics that were designed for that vessel. Perhaps the Officer Corps just needs better training and more tactics designed for specific vessels in battles for the roles they were intended. Or maybe they just need to take experience as a consideration on the battlefield. But that's an entire theoretical episode unto itself. What do you think, Remlis? I personally feel that the craft that are more generalists would probably be better suited in the long run. Because let's be honest, if you're adaptable, you're more likely to survive a battlefield situation, let's be honest. That's true. If you are adaptable, you are more likely to survive a battlefield situation. But... Um, I feel like if you used too many general craft and then didn't have specialists for situations like we don't want to get close to the enemy, we need more fighters, or Eldar who use hollow fields, you clearly need lance weapons to counteract their um, appearing multiple sensor blips in the same in the same area. I just I don't know why they don't employ officers to learn how each vessel works and then try to employ those vessels in different roles rather than having them all try to do the same thing. Fair point. But that brings us to the end of the very first episode of Void War. So we hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's been certainly an interesting experience delving into these Imperial craft, but who shall we take a look at next? That is the big question. 
because uh, obviously space marines have their own set of craft and there's obviously things like the phalanx um there's the eldari the orcs tyranids necrons tau and a few others i'm sure as well that i'm missing who do you reckon we should tackle next <sighs> i'd say eldar but i don't know if i'm ready for the eldar fanboys <laughs> but let them decide in the comments and yes. uh the next so episode, leave a comment Sorry, I, I, I can say the next episode won't be out before the new year because I'm moving at the, at the start of the new year, but immediately after moving, you can almost guarantee you know the first thing I'll make sure is ready for you. Yes, it shouldn't take as long as the last episode of Aeronautica. And it, shouldn't, and it shouldn't take as long, <laughs> nearly as long as this episode because I've already now calculated the capabilities of macro weapons and most of the general things in our method video that need to be known before you start messing around with these ships. And there's also the fact that the other races generally won't have as many ship classes as the Imperium. That's true. You got the big one out of the way. <laughs> so, thank you very much everyone who joined us today for watching this episode. Um, this has been Remnace from 40k Theories. And this has been Fiora the Tank Girl. And we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.